Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. It's not a burden. The humor and heartache of raising elderly parents is a feature length documentary that provides an intimate look presented with humor and heart at the relationships between aging parents and the adult children who care for them, examining the challenges they face and the solutions they discover along the way. Emmy-nominated filmmaker Michelle Boyaner shares her complex and de devastatingly tender journey, caring for her long-divorced aging parents, her mother Elaine, who abandoned the family and left then 19-year-old Michelle to help raise her five younger siblings and is now faced with dementia. And her father Morris, once a brilliant aerospace engineer and now a hoarder unable to navigate his own world. In the documentary, Michelle shares a diverse mix of other families, woven in each with their own unique challenges. You'll meet Esther, an entertainer whose daughters bring love and laughter to her, la to her last act, and Mike, who helps his mother Florence while raising teenagers as a single father. With humor and heart, the film explores not only the frustrations and fears, but also the transformative bonds that happen when familial roles are reversed. Is it a burden or a blessing? Maybe a little bit of both. It's not a burden. The humor and heartache of raising elderly parents is out right now and available on all VOD channels. Today, you will meet writer-director Michelle Boyaner, executive producer Aaron Lustig, along with Maxine Lapidus and brother Ken, who are featured in the documentary. And later on in the show, you'll be treated to a special performance by Danielle Ate the Sandwich, who will perform one of her featured songs. And today, they got a real excitement when the Today Show's Hoda and Jenna picked It's Not a Burden as their documentary of the month. Please welcome writer-director Michelle Boyaner and executive producer Aaron Lustig. Hello, hello. Hello, Alan. Thank you for being hello. here. Did I, get, did I get that all right? Totally, and we'd <laughs> like to a clip of that and be able to just use it so nobody else has to say it all again. <laughs> whatever you need, whatever you need. Hey, let's talk about this morning. Did you, were, you know, the Today Show, that's yeah, a pretty- It was crazy. It was like our version of, you know, the announcement of the Oscar nominations or the Independent <laughs> Spirit Awards. You know, we, we, we knew that our team was working real hard to, to get this small film noticed by such a, a world that's with so many distractions and so many options. And uh, Wendy Zipes Hunter and, and Susie Cornell of, of Prana did such an incredible job to just keep knocking on all the doors. And, and we heard late yesterday that we were gonna be their documentary of the month for June and that the Today Show audience was gonna learn about It's Not a Burden this morning. And we're just, we're, we're floating, we're giddy. It, it, it really is perfect for that audience. I mean, it's such a beautiful look at all of our complicated relationships with our parents and and that true role reversal that happens to many later in life and and most of us aren't prepared for <laughs> you know yes so take take us back um you know to, to that night you know i know you and your partner barbara were hanging out with friends when the conversation turned to your parents yeah so we and that's really how all the connections happen, including the connection of what brought Aaron, dear Aaron here on as an executive producer was that being the adult child and having those concerns for your parent. And, and he had those concerns with his mom, which I'm sure he'll share with you. But that evening we were with Maxine who will um, join us later yeah. and um, her wife, Hillary. And we were, I was talking about a dementia medication that my mother had just been uh, prescribed. And Maxine said, don't give it to her. Esther was on it and she had all kinds of crazy side effects. And, and we were just went from that to what brand of adult diapers we each used for our parents. And it just was crazy that we weren't talking about what we had just binged on Netflix or what we, what was going on in our lives. We were talking about how we were helping our parents. And, and so uh, that had a profound impact. And, and I, I thought about it a lot and, and thought that as a documentary storyteller, this was a story that I could tell, and I could not only share my story, but gather others and, and share those stories to give everyone kind of a, a way in to this, to this journey. And, and there was also a moment that I think took place before that conversation, you know, with your mother in a bathroom stall. Was that before? Yes, yes, yeah, it definitely was before. That, um, we, 
we had many, you know, that could be a whole book of, you know, behind the stall door of us <laughs> in public restrooms. That's a great title. And, you know, and str struggling with my mom to, who will initially insist she can do it herself and who will always be sort of flashing the Batman signal to the sky for me to come and join her. And, uh, but yeah, we had been struggling and we were, you know, just at a movie theater. Uh, she had chosen Magic Mike XXL that day to go see. It was her Good choice. choice. <laughs> and yeah, and we were getting her all, um, trying to get everything and get to the matinee. And she had some issues in the bathroom there. And so I crawled under the stall because <laughs> the door was locked and I helped her up and got her dressed and we were laughing and we were crying and it was really intense. And uh, a, a woman that had been at the sink and kind of overheard everything said to me that she had just lost her mom a, a few months prior and that she, she missed that and told me that I was a good daughter, you know, and, and just, just that recognition by a stranger told me again, that this was something that was absolutely universal and that there was a place for this story to be told. I mean, universal is an understatement, but really, yeah. really yeah. it is. Aaron, did you know Michelle prior? No, uh, actually I went for my annual physical. Um, <laughs> and if, if you, Seen the documentary, There's, uh, you'll see Dr. Donna Cashton in there. That happens to be my doctor. And my mother was going through a really difficult time with leukemia. And this was, I guess, four years ago when she started getting sick. And sort of, uh, you know, I, I love Dr. Cashton. And she was asking me how I was doing. And I said I was pretty sad and um, worrying about my mother. And then I was going back and forth from California to New York every month to try to help. And she said, you know, I know somebody you should talk to. And it was Michelle. And so uh, I, I picked up the phone and I think it, I, or I emailed you and said, I would love to find out what you're doing with this documentary. And that's how I became involved. And in the interim, uh, my mom passed away I'm sorry. and, um, I, I thought, you know, uh, I really, I, there was a, a period of time where I, 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 I found out all the information and then I said, let me think about it. And I was so busy trying to take care of my mother. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I wasn't able to sort of join in until she passed and there was a, a time where I thought, God, she would have been great in this movie, you know? And we wanted to. We thought maybe we could follow you to New York. And yes, because, you know, the point of view of the that's sun. That's a big, yeah, that, yeah. That's a big, well, you know, I went from New York to New Jersey to, to help my mom. That, that That's a bit of a difference from yeah, California it was, it to was New very, York. Very challenging. And I think I would have done it had she, she was in hospice care. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I thought, you know, that might be too much of an intrusion. Probably mm -hmm. was wrong about that in hindsight. Mm -hmm. um, I think she would have loved it. She started doing so well in hospice care that they kicked her out. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and they kicked her out <laughs> uh, and she went into a home. She went into the Jewish home in upstate New York where I'm from and she passed away very soon thereafter. Hmm. which also made me say, um, I, I do not ever want to go into a home. Um, and it's very important for me that my children, my adult children, watch Michelle's movie so they know <laughs> how to take care of me when it's time. When it is that, yeah. yeah. They're all when when that role is reversed, when that yeah. role is reversed. Yep. But Had you ever been an executive producer or was this the first, you know, this was just something you, you felt strongly about and wanted to be a part of? It's something I felt strongly about, about and wanted to be a part of for sure. Uh, I never, I, you know, I, I acted for decades and then I tried my hand at directing a little bit. That wasn't for me. Um, and so, you know, since actually I really retired when my mother started getting sick, I sort of lost interest in a lot of things. Um, and I think knowing Michelle and Barbara has inspired me 
uh, sort of lit my passion uh, again, maybe not for acting, but um, just to be involved, uh, to, mm. to do something that you care about. Passion projects. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, so Michelle, you know, you, you, you get this idea and there are definitely millions of, of people our age going through this with their parents. Where did you begin to start, you know, thinking about who you could cover in this movie? Yeah, well, and I absolutely want to get to that. I want to say one more thing if I oh, can yeah. about Aaron and just about producers in general and what a gift producers, executive producers are to, for me, especially to independent filmmakers, Aaron and uh, our other executive producers, but they came in and believe me, we were shaking every tree trying to raise funds for this film. And every person that came on board in the bucket brigade of funding an independent film uh, what was absolutely uh, Pivotal. It, we needed every one of those buckets, every voice that was raised on behalf of us. And and because the subject was so close to Aaron's heart and to Maxine's heart, who's also ex executive producer, uh, another dear friend, Barbara Held, um, and all went through this journey and all came in to, to help us raise funds to make this happen, uh, as well as our you know day to day producers, Wendy Zipes Hunter and Katie Ford, who took our phone calls of you know watched footage with us, held our hands, knocked on doors, did everything they could day to day. And so just as an yes. independent filmmaker with a chance to say this, I wanna say how important that is for, for small films to have that, it takes a village. So um, thank you for letting me say that because it's especially to be able to look at Aaron and say it. So, um, but yeah, we, uh, I knew that if I was gonna tell my story um, that, I wanted to be able to tell other people's stories as well. And if, if I was expecting other people to be uh, vulnerable and, and share um, you know, those, those things that I would need to do that too. And, and so we just began doing outreach through uh, social media, through senior centers, through religious organizations, through family doctors who we share, you know. Um, and- Well, we that's actually, how you, you almost yeah. got Aaron's mother. We got, we, well, that's how we got Aaron came on, but also uh, Don and Shirley who were in the film. They also, we met them through Dr. Donna, who, oh, who I didn't was know amazing. That. And uh. Paula and Trisha in the film also were through Dr. Donna. Uh. So she really, Dr. Donna, um, it was also another one of those very, very important people along this journey of uh, telling these stories. Well, you have such a diverse group of, mm -hmm. uh, of families and, and, and people that you touch upon, but then those that you focus on as well. Um, what do you think your mom mm. would, would say if she saw the movie? That's heartbreaking, right? Because she would just be eating this up. You know, she would just be eating this up. And I think she'd love it. I mean, we talked we talked a lot of the time and we would leave the little camera running and I'd say, mom, talk to people, just tell them, you know? And a lot of it was about, you know, the frustrations of, of aging and wanting to really, you know, let people know, like she didn't want to go quietly into the night. She still, you know, had, had lots of interests and things. And, and I think the idea that we really try to represent that, so there's still someone in there, even with whatever might be going on, there's still someone in there. I think she would love that. And, and just that everyone who has seen it comments on her personality and her sense mm -hmm. of humor and, you know, um, to be able to replace whatever legacy was present prior to that is, is a real, for me, feels like a real reward, you know, that she would be rem remembered that way. Do you recall mm -hmm. her when you were younger being that funny? I don't. I really don't. I mean, both my parents were funny and my dad is still funny to this day. Oh, your dad is funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But my mom is it just, it, it was so funny. And, and, and it, it took me a moment. I have to say, I, I didn't realize I was, you know, because you, you first introduced your mother and then your dad's introduced. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it was the same family at first. Like it took yeah. me a second yeah. and I was, you know, wow, that you were doing, you know, 
and two extremes. I mean, your mom who had dementia and your dad being a hoarder, my God, I mean, you know, take that role re reversal for any of us and having to care, take care of our parents yeah. just through aging in and of yeah. itself. But then right. you had those added, uh, you know, situations that they- Yeah. And, and how the about the two of them getting together? Oh, together, yeah. That was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And my that's, dad that's was fantastic. So gracious. Yeah, my dad was so gracious because he knew I was driving down from LA to take my mom to doctor's appointments. And if I wanted to be able to see him, he would have to kind of hold his nose and be there with his ex-wife, you know? And he was such a good sport. And, you know, really they came to a place that they became friends in the end, you know, right. they did. But there was a lot of anger for a long time, you know, but they were friends in the end. And, and they know that they brought these eight children into the world and, um, you know, and so it, I think that process too uh, was, was a gift, so. How long had they not seen each other when-, when Oh, they'd they'd, unf unfortunately they'd had to see each other over the years just because, you know, my dad is such a good guy. He, yeah. would, he would include my mom. She would be at all the holidays. There was a period where she remarried where we didn't interact with her at all. She saw a few of my younger siblings once she came back to town, um, but I didn't really have that much to do with her for you know um, for long periods of time. And my dad did his best to avoid her, but you know for the last twenty plus years she had been in the picture. She had been around at family gatherings, and he knew that you know that she was in everyone's lives. So well, he's a stand-up guy. He really obviously, yeah, obviously. yeah. yeah. Morris, he, he, Morris, Ma yeah. Mar Morris you know, comes across as a, as a, as a great dude in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, if you ever do the, um, the, the non-documentary version, the theatrical version, yeah. uh, I want to play him, please. <laughs> I want to play him. I want to do it. He looks so much like my late father. Oh, I never oh, wow. told you that before. I don't think you haven't. the similarity I'll, I'll show you pictures someday. Yeah. Is, Pretty stark, so. That's great. Aaron, what are some of your, from the movie, some of the other families or individuals that, that resonated or or, oh. or make you smile when you think of it? They, they all do. Um, I, 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 you know, for me, it's about Michelle's parents. I, I, I just love them so much. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but everybody, I, I don't think there's, and everybody, everybody in it is we can relate to mm -hmm. a, a little bit of this person, oh, a little bit totally. of that person. I saw my mother in so many different people, uh, and my father. Um, mm. I, I wish that's one of the things I regret not having my mother involved is the interaction between my two older brothers and I, who tried to take care of my mother. There were no daughters, and it's usually the daughter that's Absolutely. taking care of the elderly parent. And in this case, we had three boys. Uh, uh, so I, I wish we could have done that segment because it would have been <laughs> very interesting. Uh, you know, I think of Morris, and when when you saw his home, I mean, mm -hmm. my mother lived in a two bedroom apartment and not to that extreme, but was, I mean, she was a Holocaust survivor. So she saved, mm. yep. just yep. held on to everything. And I felt that anxiety watching that for, mm. for you, you know, yeah. you know, it, it really is. Uh, Wendy just commented, we heard it here first, Aaron as Morris. <laughs> right. yeah. Wendy we just, out the press release. <laughs> press release. We, just made an, <laughs> we just made an announcement. <laughs> that, that is so funny. Michelle, where did uh, documentary filmmaking come from for you? Like, was there some moment? Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've been a writer kind of my, for my whole life. I mean, really always written. But in 2000, my partner Barbara went over with a, a camera and filmed with her brother David, who has schizophrenia. And mm. she filmed about an hour with him trying to set up the answering machine. And mm. she came home with footage and showed it to me. And I said, this is a film. This is a short film. This is something we can tell this story. Um, because 
she really captured, I feel like she really captured what it must be like for him, the chaos that it must be like for him. So we sat together and edited and Barbara's our editor and has been our editor for every film and cinematographer and, um, and, and put that film together. And that was our first film together. And we premiered at South by Southwest in 2001. And then there was kind of no stopping us. Uh, subjects, stories just found us. They would tap us on the shoulder. You know, the universe would say, tell this story. And there it was, and mm -hmm. we would do it. And, and so we did a couple of documentary shorts, a couple of narrative shorts, and then we've now, this is our third feature documentary. So and I think the fourth one's gonna be behind the stall door. <laughs> Starring Dr. Can... Tim Reed. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, there it is, Dr. Tim Reed. But well, we do have to talk about Dr. Tim Reed. Please. So, so daytime fans, you know, will recognize Mr. Lustig as Dr. Tim Reed from The Young and the Restless. What what do you remember about your time spent in Genoa City? <laughs> it was fun. It was really fun. I was a, you know, a, a, a what is it, a duck out of water, I think is what they say. Something like that. Uh, for for a short bald Jewish character actor <laughs> to be having sex with a gorgeous tall redhead redhead uh, right? It, even though it wasn't something that she wanted to do, it was still fun. Um, and they they wrote really well for me. Uh, so I have a, a lot of fond memories. Um, and she's a powerhouse, Michelle Stafford. Oh, she right? sure is. Yeah, she was great to work with. Everybody treated me really well there, I have to say. And I, I made some lifelong friends. And, um, uh, you know, could I come back for a, a third round? I'm open to it. I don't know if I could memorize the lines anymore. No, I'm sure you But I had, I sure had a vision could. in my head. I probably, well, maybe with some cue cards. But I thought maybe I could come back as... Uh, Dr. Tim's twin brother, who's a detective trying to solve his murder, and then also play uh, Dr. Reed's sister, uh, who's perhaps a, a judge. Or we, we need to send this over to, to you know, yes. yeah, YNR. The Bell family. Yeah, yeah to, to the Bell family. Um, oh, I had a question. It, it just says, oh, please, please remind the viewers uh, how Dr. Tim Reed died. <laughs> well, having I was I was gone for about ten years. <laughs> I think I was in jail or something. I don't remember. And then they brought me back, uh, and they killed me off by giving me an overdose of Viagra and wine. I, I don't know if that can actually kill you or not, but. <laughs> Uh, don't, it, don't try this at home. Right. <laughs> Although I have. <laughs> and I'm still here. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a, that was a kind of a strange way to go out. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably the strangest uh, daytime soap death I've heard. I, yeah. I, I didn't know that's how, you know, he, he passed. M it. Michelle, what, what do you hope people take away most from the film? Um, that that Viagra and wine can kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, our film. Um, what I it's really not a burden. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was so wrapped up in, in Aaron's story. It's um, not Doctor Tim Reed. No, I, I just thought that a character should come on and do a podcast about your murder, and it should become very much like you know these podcasts that then become the documentary series, and then your character can come on. And yeah. anyway, yes. So it's not a burden. Sorry. Um, we really hope that this film will reach people and let them know they're not alone, that they'll see so many people going through this and, and know that, that, you know, gosh, sometimes if they have that frustration to grab a pillow and place it over their mother's face, maybe Michelle went through that, you know, and um, that also to, again, respect and, and do our best to be patient and to regard our parents and see them uh, as, who they were as well as who they are now, you know, and, and, and to hopefully just really kind of bring love to what's to this world, what's going on in this world right now. This has felt so urgent to get this, you know, film filled with love out into the world. So it is really that just to, to give that love and, and that knowing you're not alone. I just had this like random thought, like it's, it's kind of like you should let the film be out for like a month and then do 
um, like, like a book club, like a, a chat with a lot of the families for, for other people who have yeah. watched because everybody is going to learn something. We all have questions on, you know, how to do it. I mean, I'm sure while you were going, you know, Aaron flying across the country, Michelle, you dealing with your mother and father, me dealing with my mother when she had lung cancer, you, you question, are you doing these things correct? There is no right or wrong. There is no answer. That's right? true. And the thing is that with, with the other, the opposite end of this, when someone is pregnant and they're excited and they're having a baby, there's a million books. And then you're a new parent. There's yep. a million books and there's every resource and people throw you a shower. Yeah. And when it's the opposite where you're helping your parents at, to age gracefully, it doesn't seem that it's all right there for you. That, and, and so that is the conversation we're hoping to start. And we are hoping to, we're planning to have a theatrical tour with this film in 2022, where we go to major cities and do real events and gather large groups to have these conversations and have resources available and really help establish, build, build that course for people and let them see what that is. You, and you're so right. I mean, you know, you always hear pregnant women talk about, oh, somebody's offering me advice again. This isn't a subject we get advice on. No, no. T taking care of your parent isn't something people no. reach out to you. With. There's no yeah. manual. There's no, no manual. Nobody, yeah, nobody threw a shower for me and gave me two walkers, one for each parent, <laughs> and you know, uh, you know, gender reveal cakes and all that. It, it just it, you're in it. You're in it, and you got to figure all that stuff out yourself. So. So Danielle ate the sandwich is going to perform at the end of the show today. You uh, used her in your previous documentary. Um, how did you meet her? Yeah, that's great. We, we are so fortunate to have uh, kind of a community of amazing musicians and singer songwriters. And Danielle, we met um, on a short, we were on a short film, The Bedwetter. Uh, and uh, Danielle <clears throat> actually... I have a sister named Danielle who, who had passed away. And one night while we were in post-production on our film, I was missing her very much and thinking about the music for our film. And I went onto iTunes and in the iTunes search window, I typed, I started typing the name Danielle and lots of different Danielles came up, but Danielle ate the sandwich. And I said, what, what is that? With my tears of missing my sister. And I clicked and I started listening to these songs and she's such a poet and mm. she's so her, her music, uh, her, her voice. And I mean, just every single part was perfect. And so we coincidentally, she was going to be playing the hotel cafe here in Los Angeles. And we went to her show and she heckled us from stage and uh, we talked <laughs> to her afterwards and I told her about the film and asked her, told her one of one song in particular would be perfect for it and asked if we might be able to use that. We didn't really have a music budget. And she said, I'm a, I'm a terrible judge of character. Yes, you can use it. <laughs> she, she let us use that song and I promised we'd make it up to her. And then first chance we had, we our, our last feature packed in a trunk, Danielle came on and, and composed the score and wrote, she'll know better, but she wrote over a dozen original songs for that film. And, uh, we were so lucky to have that. And I knew when we, when we were doing this film that we wanted Danielle to create the big moment songs, the three big songs. And she did such a beautiful job of that. And then we were so fortunate to have Joanna Ketcher uh, compose the rest of the score. And um, with her band of merry gentlemen, these wonderful musicians who brought the seventies singer songwriter vibe that I wanted with the rock drums and, Kind of from my childhood growing up, I wanted the music to have that feeling. Piano, rock piano and rock guitar and, and drums. And, and it was just beautiful. Just so fortunate. So fortunate. And thank you for asking about that. Well, yeah, I was, you know, she's coming on later. I, I, I was curious how, how, how you met. Now, Aaron, you said you don't act anymore. You, you... Uh, just like Moira Rose, if they asked for me, <laughs> I might consider it. Um, I, no, I did retire. Um, do, do again, you have a favorite role that you've played over the years? I mean, you've done looking at your IMDb, my God, the list. 
it goes on a for lot days. Of doctors. <laughs> you were a judge recently uh, on Grey's Anatomy, Aaron. Right? That was the last thing I I did actually. Um, I've done a lot of judges, a lot of lawyers, a lot of doctors, and um, I think honestly, I, Dr. Reed was probably my favorite because it was the most diverse and. Uh, I also did a movie called uh, If These Walls Could Talk um, with oh, Demi Moore, and yeah. I played the abortion doctor oh, uh, that, that killed her on the t kitchen table. That, was that, that a Showtime? Uh, HBO. A Showtime? Yeah. HBO. 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 I knew it was a, yeah, I knew it was one of those things. It wasn't a huge role, but um, it's one of those times I watched my work and I went, not bad. Not bad. <laughs> but so you watch. I do. I do. I do. Usually in private, so people can't hear me going. Oh my God, he got so old, or you know, uh, it's not. It's not easy to watch. But I've always been the funny. same. You know, ball, the, the same. It doesn't. It doesn't change. That's yeah. so funny. Well, I'm about about to bring out Maxine and, and Brother Ken, and I want to say thank you. But um, Michelle, for you, besides mom and dad. Who else in the movie for you are some of your... Oh, I mean, they're all... And that might be hard. It really is. And to tell you the truth, we filmed... There were 32 stories. So all those... We, we have 20 that made it into the film. So there are 12 families that didn't even make it into the film, which is heartbreaking. And believe me, it was torturous. So mm -hmm. the people that... The, the, there are so many beautiful stories that aren't there that will live somewhere else. It, it will be there. But, uh, you know, Maxine... You you know we have certain arcs that did that we did create larger pieces for Maxine and Esther and uh, yeah, I, yeah is, for, is really sure. you know and and, and, and that was going to be also Mike and his mom Florence because he represents the sons really you know mm -hmm, and right. the sandwich dad kind of thing so um, but they all are they're all favorites you know I, I was uh, one of my questions that I didn't get to but was going to be about you know um, cutting out like how much. Footage did you have? Um, you know, of hours and yeah, and, you know, I'm sure and the families didn't make it in, and it was it was really difficult. I mean, there was a three and a half hour cut. I was really happy with, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so. the ex the extended version, the director's cut. Yes, um, yes. I, it, I, you know, I've had a blast talking to you. So it is literally sorry. It is pitch black right now out in New Jersey. Like I could see oh, wow. out of the peripheral of my eye, like I wow. think there's a storm happening. It just, oh, no. the whole house is just pitch black all of a sudden. Oh, it's so right. weird. But anyway, congratulations. Really a pleasure to speak Thank to you. You too. Thank um, you so much for doing this and shining a light are, on the film. You are so welcome. I'm so excited to talk to my next guest, but I will, uh, and like, if you want, you can watch backstage. Great, great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Alan. so much. Thanks Bye well. Aaron. All righty. Oop, give me one second. Sorry. All right, here we go. My apologies. So in the film, Maxine Lapidus's mother, Esther, is a larger than life entertainer who still has a lot of performing up her sleeve and her daughters, Maxine and Sally, do everything they can to make sure she has an audience. Brother Ken Curley cared for his, his mother, but he also cared for a group of retired brothers at the Holy Family community. Brother Ken also performed with Maxine's mother, Esther, and has known their family for decades. Please welcome to the locker room, Maxine Lapidus and Brother Ken. And give me one second, I'm having trouble getting to that. Uh, here we go, my apologies, there we are. Brother Ken and Maxine. Sorry oh, about that. Thanks whoa. for being here. Whoa. Technical hi, difficulties. Hi, Brother <laughs> Hi, Max. How you doing? Delighted. And Alan, thank you. No, for thank you very much. Oh, oh yeah, so welcome, nice Brother you, Ken. Alan. Nice to meet you. And I, I, I'm going to tell a little secret that Brother Ken is a big Young and the Restless fan. Oh, huge. <laughs> I hope, I, I, all I can say is I hope he's watching from backstage. There'll be many more questions coming his way, like when Catherine Chancellor attended her own funeral. But that's, oh my God, that's for another God. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Max, Maxine, you, uh, you know, sorry for the loss of your mother, but your mother, man, she was something else in this movie. Well, and in, and in life, I mean, you should. I'm sure. Jiminy Cricket. She, uh, how, she do you keep, how, how do you keep up with her? Uh, not easy. 
you know, I mean, I say we were the bus and truck sort of Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher because, you know, we were in the local Pittsburgh version of that because my mother was, you know, very always. Yeah, just always describe up. Esther. Describe Esther. <laughs> Go ahead. Is, uh, well, she kind of resembled B. Arthur. She was very tall with gray hair and had a great presence to her mm -hmm. and was of the old school comedians. You know, she, she used to do like Yiddish stories, like, you know, a little bit of Fanny Bryce in there and a little bit of Phyllis Diller in there. And then she would talk about her husband, Saul Dahl, who was my father. <laughs> and she'd be like, you know, he's so romantic. You know, he said things to me like, why'd you dust that table? I had a phone number written on it. <laughs> you know, so her act was like, you know, a, a little of everything. And then she sang these amazing songs. Yeah. So when I was growing up and when I met Brother Ken, he was in this show with Essie. Yep. And I was a little kid and they became friends. And then Ken became a part of our family. And, you know, we were very aware of his family's circumstances and his mom and grandma who were delightful and hilarious and wonderful aging and his dad and and then as i moved to la and sally my sister and i started our careers in show business too as writers and really kind of went behind the camera you know my first job was with ellen burston on a tv show this is going way back and she said to me you can either eat cake or be an actress and i decided to eat cake and be a writer so that worked out well for me um but you know as we were behind the camera uh, and then, you know, Esther was aging and, and Saul Dahl, and we brought them out to Palm Springs to live. And when they were really still agile, they could go back and forth and stay in Pittsburgh and go to Palm Springs. And then it became harder and harder for them to get around. You're right. And your mother, my mother at like 80, what, eight or something broke a hip. And then Ooh. it was like, you know, then you start getting into the nineties and it starts to get wacky. So um, I think the most amazing thing about her was that she never lost her sense of humor. Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah, you can see that because how, never. what is, I, I didn't get to ask Michelle, but what is the year span of following the parents in the film? Well, what's so amazing about the whole thing was, you know, Michelle and I have been friends for almost 25 years. So in a weird way, she and Barbara became the, you know, the unofficial sort of documentarians of our lives because they were around Esther and Saul during these transitions. My mother was sort of very active in the theatrical scene in Pittsburgh in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So the footage of her, you know, she was like Christina Applegate in Anchorman. She was like part of the WIIC news team in yeah. Pittsburgh. She was the entertainment, you know, be like this, you know, and she'd like give them the movie. <laughs> And so it was hilarious when I saw Anchorman because I was like, oh my God, that was my mom. But um, so, so, so what was cool was we had some of this footage that we were able to give Michelle and Barbara for the film. But then as they were moving out here and getting older, they would just take home movies of us, you know? And so that was also just amazing that they had these years and years of footage for the film. So the film was about five years, I think, that, that is really the focus of, of mom's the last five years of her life. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. And, and brother Ken, you also had the role reversal of taking care of your mom, correct? I did. And, and, and what do you recall about that experience? Well, what I recall is my parents and my grandmother and Maxine can back all this stuff up because she knew everybody. Yeah. But they never, never interfered with my life in a healthy way, in a healthy sense. Uh, when I joined the brothers a million years ago and was teaching and so forth, they were very self-reliant, self-sufficient folks. One day when she was 90, I got a call and I was, I guess I was teaching in St. Mary's in Berkeley at the time. And she said, I need you to come home. Now, this was something she never said. My father had already died. My grandmother had died. Uh, I went to my superiors and said, look, I've got to go. I've got to do this. And which leads to a whole other question, other set of questions when, you know, when people's lives are disrupted. Well, that's what you do. Uh, so I went. That's right. Not knowing what was ahead of me, like so many others. 
I was I, I took care of her for five years. And, and as as Maxine oh, wow. and yourself, you all know how the regression happens. It goes down and down and down. It doesn't get better and you don't have more free time. You don't. And what uh, I just did that. You, you, I just did it. You know, without having that, you talked about it before. There is no manual. There are no sets of instructions or people right. out there to give That's you advice. Right. There's and no, no awards either. No awards. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Well, there are. I there are rewards in the sense, oh, but only awards. after it's done. That you look back and say, "Oh yeah, I, I would have. I could have never done otherwise. Would never have done otherwise." Both of you can attest to that. So I, you know, I just did it, and what 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 was presented was presented. I dealt with it as I had to, out of love and care, and uh, knowing, as Michelle had said earlier, you know, they're still in there, and I think you both know from your moms and your dads that they're in there. I always like to say they they have young blood, but they keep it in old containers. That's the difference, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. and that youthfulness will always shine through in some way, shape, or form, and that's what we. And now, I guess, us, we're the next up. I have to remember that and pass on to others. We're, st we're still in there. We're still in there. That, that's a, yeah. we, all, we all need T-shirts for later in life. We're still in here. Yeah. Um, Brother Ken, how did you start performing with Esther? Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> I, I'm a ham. You might not guess that, but I figured if Dolores Hart could do this, so could I. <laughs> Uh, except that I don't wear like a little beret or something. But, you know, I, I was always performing. I was always performing. And uh, in high school, and then I was in operettas. I, Maxine, I, we didn't know each other then. The Mary Operetta Company in Pittsburgh produced all Victor Herbert stuff, and the Savoy Yards produced Gilbert and Sullivan. Well, I was more Victor Herbert guy. So it was the only two times in my life I ever played a juvenile. So I sang and I acted like a ham and it was great. And there was a, there was a, an all call or a posting in 1970 uh, for this radio review called Don't Touch That Dial. And there were auditions scheduled and I went to audition because I'm a big old radio fan. Check my IM, uh, IMDB site. I should have been dead 70 years already. But uh, <laughs> yeah, seriously, I'll tell you about that if you want to know later. So I answered it and I, I got the job. You know, I was the quote unquote, the male lead or the comic or the top banana or whatever. But the biggest thrill for me, because that's when Esther was going into the on, on WIC, she was going to tell, I was going to meet Esther Lapidus. Now, you would have thought. I was, almost like she was on The Young and the Restless, but not. Almost. Well, none, of that, none of that hadn't come on yet. No. It was the sure. old and the restless. You know, was she was old and remain and restless. Old restless. Yeah. So I walked into the studio and I was as nervous as anybody could be. I was going to meet Esther Lapidus. And uh, as Max said, I mean, we clicked right away. We did all the shtick. Uh, it was like performing like with Sophie Tucker or Eddie Cantor, or those people you do not see any longer in show business. Mm -hmm. You just don't find these people anymore. And I had the privilege of working with her and learning from her. And some of the things that I learned from, I'd never say on television, but I mean, but it was wonderful. And it was, it, it morphed into a, a wonderful relationship and a second family for me yeah. and hopefully for Max and Sally and no, Saul and Yes. And yeah, it was great. So we performed all That's kinds of wonderful things. August of 1970. I remember that. Well, it sounds like she was performing up until the day she took her last breath. My God, right? Yeah, she pretty much was. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I think you find with, with a lot of the aging, too, is when they can't, you know, remember if there's some dementia or things like that. But she could remember every lyric to every song. So she couldn't remember what day it was or what she had for lunch or who she was talking to at the time. But you started singing any song between 1920 and 1979. <laughs> you know, anything on Sirius XM. And she was just like, boom, she knew every single lyric. So we would drive, you know, to appointments or we would go and I just bring Louis Prima or Sinatra or something in the car. And even if she was just very quiet, boom, she burst into, into song with every, you know, every fiber of her. And when she passed, actually, what was so amazing was, um, you know, the nice thing was that she really didn't suffer. And it kind of was a very quick um, passing, but we were in the hospital and 
I had my iPhone and I thought, oh, I'm going to play her some music. And I put on, you know, her favorite songs. And Michelle and Barbara were there because they're good friends. Sorry, that's not me barking. That's my dog. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> They get excited in this part of the story. Um, and anyway, so they, they like that song too. They do, they do. They, they're a little off key, but they're they're not bad. Um, and so anyway, we played her out. And she was, you could just see that even though she was transitioning, she could hear the music. She was and literally, I've never done this in my life. We stood up and we gave her a standing ovation as she was passing. I mean, it was wild. And it was a very moving experience for me because what normally, you know, is a deeply sad, deeply, you know, very kind of low, furious. It was like, yeah, go mom, go, you did it. You had a great life, you did your gig and we love you. And we're sending you off with applause and singing and dancing. And I mean, so that was kind of, you know, what can you do after that? It was- that I mean, was if you would ask me how Esther should go out, <laughs> that's what you would say. I mean, you know, watching the movie, that's how you, you think she would deserve to, yeah. to go it, out. It was actually, it was very moving. It was very special. Um, but, you know, Ken came over uh, several times to where she was living and cheered her up and you know they would burst into song together and you know it was just he always would know exactly what to do and you well, know he, there's a, is there a i want to is jump there a in. favorite song that you and esther like to sing well ken and i have a favorite song that we like to sing is it the good morning glory song it is the good morning glory song oh. Ready? Dun -dun -dun. you wait a minute we're gonna do that here yes it's right now good oh. morning glory say there's nothing a brand new day, day is dawning. dawning. So pull up and the sun come 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 through. Good morning, <laughs> glory. Spend, Spend about, about an hour. hour. Run up delay. Shower. Shower. And, <laughs> and keep on singing like, like, sing like the birdies do. Ho hum. Ho hum. Ho -hum. <laughs> waiting for your toast. <laughs> Call the one you love the most. Pick up the phone and start and say, Good morning, glory. Were you I dreaming of me? me? And do you still oh, love me? Well, no, baby, baby here's, here's a kiss, kiss for, for you. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you remember the symbol. Uh, <laughs> that, that was, my was, that was an outtake. It's somewhere on Facebook, I guess. With oh, Michelle. Sure. But, but I, I want to tell you when you talked about Esther's memory. Yeah. That she didn't, She's a, she was amazing, as Maxine can attest personally up to the end. Maxine called me when I was up at St. Mary's and she said, I, I'd like you to come down and see mom. And given my want, to, you know, you, everybody gets busy and everybody said, yo, yeah, I'll come down and, you know, I'll put it off and, you know, I, I, I'll get there at some point. A few days later, Max called me up and said, I have the plane ticket and I have the hotel room. You've got to come down. But there was no, I don't think, Max, there was any real urgency as far as life is concerned at that point where you didn't express it. I when, didn't maybe express it, but I knew, I knew something. things were changing. There, I'd yeah. been through it enough to know that there was a transition and happening. And you said, mom wants to see you. So mm -hmm. I couldn't say no to that. Of course not. So when Max and our friend Alan picked me up at the Burbank airport, and Alan commented that every hair of mine was in place and it was heavily sprayed, and I said yes. <laughs> you can open the windows now. But we were going over and Max said to me, now, don't be surprised when you go out and see mom. She might not even remember you. And she might. And I said, well, that doesn't matter. I, you know, I, I'm under, I understand all of this. So we go out to the, the, the little place, the really pretty house where she lived. Yeah, it was like she a was out, She was out on the lanai or the patio or whatever you want to call it. And I saw her, but she was being interviewed, if I remember correctly, by Michelle. And there was a camera and I said to Max, I said, well, wait, I'll wait until it's said, No, no, come out, come out. Well, I went out and Michelle and Barb just kept on filming. They said, do you mind? I said, no. I said, this may be my 15 minutes on the back, <laughs> on the back of poor Esther. But no, I said, no. <laughs> Not only did Esther remember me, she remembered stuff I completely forgot. We launched into songs and routines that we hadn't done in almost 50 years. So, you know, and I always touted the fact that, Esther, I'm your last living co-star. 
but Mitzi McCall <laughs> took, me, took me to the the mat on that. She is, but but it was amazing yeah. to be with her. It was like being Maxine says it in the in the film. Uh, it's like seeing her forty years ago. Yeah, I'm, mm. I think this is a, a phenomenon that's so interesting as as we all get older. Mm. That you know, I've I've seen other films and heard you know doctors speak about it, neurologists and things like that, where you know the music is something that really ties in, mm. um, and it, it's a it's a it's a, a connector. And I think you know the, the thing that that is so wonderful about having Ken in my life and also in the film is, you know, he was a connection to my mother at that time and remained so. And so it's very rare when you're, when you move around the country and people pass and you're older that you have people who know you from the time you were a little kid mm, and know yeah. what's important to you. You know, you might be lucky enough to have a brother or sister who, who remembers some of that, but to be able to kind of hold that memory of someone with you and for you, is very very special and i think you know the film the film I, i'm just so proud of what michelle and barbara have done because i think it's so mm -hmm. relatable i mean just in in the last couple of days I, I i'm i didn't hear the very beginning of the show alan forgive me for missing the top but i i'm sure you mentioned that it was picked by the today I show. did, of yeah. course because you, you you told me that which was uh, thank yeah, you for sharing and, that and what was so cool about that was when hoda was talking about it she related instantly into this story about when someone was talking down to her because they thought she was too old to get it. And it took me back so drastically to remembering, you know, if I was curt or, or quick with my mom or with an elderly person or, you know, uh, how, how you change in being given the opportunity to care for someone. You become more compassionate you become more patient you become more understanding yep. you know sometimes just unbuttoning a button and being able to rebutton <laughs> it is a good day you know it's I'm a good day you know, you know what you just said about that connection to that period or that to our family i mean i even think social media in some respect like both of my parents are gone and if i post a picture my mother's neighbor will make a comment you know that she you know just remembers what my mother was like or what my mother did for her you know, and it, it just brings that, you know, just cheers you up, you know, brings a smile to your face. Absolutely. Having, having that connection to, uh, uh, you know, cause you know, the, you know, having this role reversal is not a fun thing for any of us. It's you know? deep. And, it's deep. And yeah, uh, it's still and losing a parent is deep and hard. And Very. Hard. There. Yeah. It doesn't matter how, and people will say they mean well, you know, they'll, when your parent has, has gone, and my grandmother, for instance, and Max remembers, she died at 101. She, 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 she fell down carrying groceries up the steps mm -hmm. and she was gone. So, I mean, but people will come up and say, meaning well, well, at least you had her for a long time. That's poor consolation. It really is. And I don't mean to be harsh. And I think really, the longer you have someone you love with you, the mm -hmm. more difficult it is. It's a right. terrible jolt to have somebody very young die. But yeah. when you're used to it, like any routine or any any comfortable shoe or whatever it is you want to liken it to, that person has been around and been in your life and part of it for such a long time. Well, that's a chunk of you removed. And, you know, when people say closure, I... I really don't believe in that. I don't believe in closure. I believe there is, a, you know, some settlement of things. But closure is really a Hollywood kind of word, I think. I, there's never really closure because there's always something. That reminds you. That will remind you of or, or, or a, 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 a sensory feeling, a smell, a, 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 something you see or whatever it is. So, I mean, th there's never closure. and Maybe that's the way it's supposed and to no be. And no matter how long they're gone, that's right. we always miss them. Yes, you know that that uh, that nice, that never did. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I was going to say, Alan. Yeah. I think what's what's interesting though is the the coloring of that missing, the flavor of that can mm -hmm. mellow or change, or yeah. you can be more wistful about it or more positive about it most of the time. But sometimes it's still grief is a funny thing, isn't it? It still can hit you like a ton of bricks. And each one of us completely differently. 
That's right. Yeah, everybody grieves differently. Maxine, Brother Ken, thank you so much. Danielle, we're, we're going to be treated to a beautiful song from Danielle Ate the Sandwich in just a minute. That's wonderful. Thank you both for Alan, being here. Thank you very thank much, Maxine. I love, my love to you, Maxine. My you love to you. you and Alan, it has been a joy, absolute joy. And when I get my next talking picture, I'll make sure you interview me. <laughs> okay, I right? appreciate that. Have a great day. Yeah, Thanks you too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Danielle Ate the Sandwich is a stage name of pop folk singer-songwriter Danielle Anderson, who got her start in Fort Collins, Colorado. She has been touring nationally since 2009 after cultivating an online following from her homemade videos on YouTube. Danielle Ate the Sandwich has made appearances internationally, open for Mumford & Sons, Suzanne Vega, and wrote the soundtrack to the Emmy-nominated HBO documentary, Michelle's documentary, Packed in a Trunk, The Lost Art of Edith Lake. Please welcome to the locker room, Danielle Ate the Sandwich. Hi, Danielle, you're muted. Oh my goodness, hello, hi, <laughs> Alan, are. how are you? <laughs> how are you? Thank you so much for being here. It's so fun to be here. I've enjoyed the interviews that you've had with the team so the far, team. so I'm honored to get to be a part of this great interview. Well, I was so glad Wendy suggested it. Um, from your point of view, because I saw you comment, talk about that first meeting with Michelle that you remember. Yeah, the first time we met, which was at a show I played in L.A., um, they obviously just give off great vibes. They're fun. Um, they're caring. They emit a light. It was Michelle and Barbara and a group of their friends. Um, so the first time I met them, they obviously made me feel comfortable and at home. And I was just getting started in the music business. So to tour to L.A. and have some filmmakers want to work with me felt like a, a big a big step forward in That's what awesome. was possible for my career. And it has turned out to be such a great relationship to work with them as friends, as collaborators, and of course, on their fantastic projects, especially this this new one, It's Not a Burden. It's been a, a, the honor of, of my lifetime. What did you think when you heard about the, the idea of this documentary and, and writing for it and then seeing it? Yeah, uh, the offer, um, sounded great. It, it sounds like such an important, it sounded like such an important issue and it is. And at the time I was um, going through that, watching my mom put my grandma into a mm -hmm. care facility. And then um, later on I had to put with my sister, we put our dad into hospice care at a nursing home. So even though I'm, I'm younger, it was something that was happening to me. So it became and watching it, it, more... it, it, it sort of in, gives you some perspective Absolutely. There's so much to relate to. There's so much comfort in seeing all the different types of stories and all the different types of um, things that are happening to the parents and the ways that the, the children are coming to terms with it and dealing with it. So it gave me comfort. It I watched with my boyfriend the final cut I had seen previous versions. And we, you know, at one minute we're going, <laughs> that is so cute. That's so fun. And then the next going, oh, <laughs> and so it, it is a laugher and a crier, and um, totally, it, is, it was it great is, to get to, to work on it at all. It is totally all of that wrapped into one. You you, you nailed it on the head. So so take take me back. How did you uh, you just are a musician, uh, a songwriter, and did you just start posting things to YouTube? To, yeah, to just share your talent. Yep, I got started kind of playing open mic nights in my hometown, Fort Collins, Colorado, at the same time posting videos to YouTube. So I have a large YouTube following now. I have over 200 videos that are original wow. songs of mine, covers, some comedy videos, interviews like this. And, um, and I hit YouTube around 2007 when it was still relatively just getting started and people were just kind of being known. Now there's so much content that it's it's hard to comb through it. But through that, uh, people all over the world found my music. And then when I toured out and played shows in different places, people showed up and said, I saw you on YouTube. So um, mm -hmm. YouTube is a, is a great reason for my career. I'm an original songwriter and it, it's a great place to get to get uh, to share my music and have people get to know it. 
um, before I play for them. And um, so I love YouTube. It's It's been a big part of my career. And I'm, I know you use it a lot too. For yeah, I do. I mean, I'm new to it. But w when did you realize you could write a song? Oh, I was writing young, probably fourth grade. I have like a notebook of sort of cheesy love songs. Um, that I still have. And then it took me a while to gain confidence and to kind of grow into my own skin and say, I'm doing this and I'm good at it. And that hit later in life. I was in my early twenties before I started performing and practicing the experience of getting on stage and sharing my voice. And since then um, I'm 35 now. So it's been about 15 years of a whirlwind of me getting on stage and um, singing my, my heart out and through wow. the experience, I've had these amazing um, opportunities, starting so small, what felt so small and, and tiny and getting these awesome experiences like writing well, for film what, and touring. I loved and, what Michelle said about looking, she was searching for her sister's name. And I mean, how precipitous, I mean, like that's just amazing. That that's yeah. amazing. It's it's one of those moments that it just feels like something else is happening here. Right, you, you both had no control me. over that. Yeah, you both have you're no, meant to you meet know? the people you're yeah. meant to meet. And and yeah. their friendship has been such a gift in my life, creatively and emotionally. And um, they're so supportive and encouraging. And it's it's great to be their friend. And Who are some of your role models, songwriters? Oh, that yeah. you? I love the divas. Um, I love Taylor Swift and Lady Gaga and Katy Perry. I love Paul Simon as a, a, the, mm. the 60s and 70s songwriters, yeah. Joni Mitchell. Um, I, well, also, I mean, I thought of Taylor when you mentioned the notebooks, because I mean, you know, that's something you just hear a lot about, just, you know, always writing. Absolutely. She's a prolific young. I love how she handles herself, how she demands respect. She's also making music like the selling of music. Um, legitimate again in a, in a time of age where it's really hard to get people to purchase your music. And um, she's really adding worth and value and the importance to supporting artists and music that you love. So she's- And um, women. And women, absolutely. And women. She owns her spot as a powerful yeah. woman. She yeah, is. That, that, that's what is, is amazing. So what is the song you're gonna sing for us now? I'm gonna perform I Could Have Sworn, which is the song featured in the opening credits of the film. And it's about kind of how fast time flies and how you end up in these places so so soon and, and it can be heartbreaking and pass so quickly and how you really have to rely on each other, the, you know, the parent and the, the, the child through these moments where it's difficult and you're not exactly sure how to handle it, but you can get through it together. And before I introduce you, I realize I need the, the most important question answer for myself. Where does Danielle eat the sandwich come from? Yeah, <laughs> I can't believe I almost forgot that. It's quite a name, right? There's really um, not much of a story. I wanted a stage name that was fun and friendly and didn't take itself too seriously because I love writing songs about emotion and serious things. But I always want to offer uh, a come as you are sort of experience. So it's really just to have fun. And I do think sandwiches are really fun and delicious and cute delicious. to put on t-shirts. I'm, I'm having friends over tomorrow and I ordered from Just Subs. So <laughs> Yay, that sounds like a great party, my kind of party. <laughs> so there you go. Well, Danielle ate the sandwich, please take it away. Great, here is I Could Have Sworn from the new documentary, It's Not a Burden. Reaching for 
on my phone, I'm still dialing your number, dear. Ooh, 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 ooh. I could have sworn you taught me to breathe before you were here. I was a mess down at your feet. I could have sworn I thought it came free Until my heart broke open and the room was empty Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Are you excited, you know, now that 50% of the country is vaccinated and, and things are opening up? Are you excited to perform live again? Yes, I think I am. I, I got really comfortable in my little quarantine bubble. <laughs> and um, I had a live stream the other night that had some technical issues and there was so much to control, you know, being the stream yard, the, <laughs> the management <laughs> stuff. And yeah. I thought, I can't wait to play live again because it's a little bit easier. You just walk on stage and sing your songs. <laughs> and and just, I think, yeah. That, yeah, I probably miss it even more than I remember uh, to just feel the energy of an audience again and to get to sing when, on the microphone. When again. was the last time you were live on stage? Do yeah, you know? the last show I played was in February of 2020. And uh, it was it was a great show. So I had a good last memory. Uh, but, you know, as things progress, I had to slowly cancel all the gigs I had for 2020. And a lot of those have rescheduled now that things are opening up. So good, good, good. Well, we I musicians hope if you get will be back on stage soon. If you get to the New York, New Jersey area, I will absolutely come and check you out. I would love to. That'll be fun. Bring a sandwich. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> you, you, deal. Deal. Yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to it's meet so you. Nice Thank you so much you. for singing today. Thank you for having me, Alan. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Thanks, everybody, for watching today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks to the It's Not a Burden team and Prada, uh, Prana PR for setting this all up. It's Not a Burden is out right now and available on all video on demand channels. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so right below. Turn on all the notifications. Uh, for reminders of the upcoming episodes. Have a great weekend, everybody. And please check out It's Not a Burden. It's out now and available. It is fabulous.